I'm a simple scientist. So yes, yeah, it's, it's difficult for you I, to know, but I, I am actually a stunned, and I don't understand it. Yeah, uh, because I mean, all the pandemic preparedness plans were there, and they were just ignored. Uh -huh. And we still have situations uh, in the U.S. where the schools are being closed, are, are closed for, uh, uh, for to great detriment to children, and of course, especially to working class children, because children in more affluent families they can have a tutor or they can go to private school or which are open, uh, or do some part schooling and so on. So, so this is highly detrimental to children and not just education, but also their physical health, their mental health and their social development. Hello and welcome to Mind the Shift, a podcast about a shifting world and shifting minds. I'm your host, Anders Bolling. When this year, 2020, has become an entry in the history books, one thing will dominate completely in the description. You all know what I'm talking about. It feels like years, but it was only actually only some nine months ago that this virus began to alter the behavior of people in almost every country on Earth. Pretty soon, the mindset of better safe than sorry became the mainstream among decision makers. But from day one, the benefits of different measures have been discussed among experts. However, those who have been critical to lockdowns have sometimes been met with hostility from those who advocate the mainstream strict measures. One of those who have testified about this is the Oxford epidemiology professor Sunetra Gupta, who was a guest on Mind the Shift in July. Another expert who finds himself in the same corner of the ballpark, so to speak, as Sunetra Gupta, is my guest today, Martin Kuldorf. He's a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School in Boston and a biostatistician and epidemiologist at Brigham and Women's Hospital, also in Boston. Welcome to the show, Martin. Thank you so much, Anders. It's a great pleasure. I hope that was a correct description of your uh, CV of your work situation? Uh, yes, and uh, I have worked for a couple of decades with infectious disease outbreaks, uh, okay. working with many uh, public health departments around the world on how to detect and uh, monitor infectious disease outbreaks. I also uh, work with uh, vaccine safety uh, uh, to monitor the safety of vaccines and as well as, as drugs. So those are my research interests. So it's very closely connected to uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Yeah, that's perfect. Yeah, I also want to ask a little bit about the vaccine, of course, which there's a lot of talk about now. So it's, it's, it's really excellent that you have that expertise as well. And I understand you, you began your academic journey in uh, the small university town of Umeå in Sweden. Uh, yes, I did. Okay. And that's my hometown too, so... So for how long have you been in the United States and worked at, at Harvard? I have worked at Harvard for about 17 years now. Okay. And That's I've been time. in the United States. Before that, I worked at the National Institutes of Health, uh, uh, which is the, the federal uh, research institutes uh, in Washington, not down in Washington or in Maryland. Okay. So, Martin... Uh, in October, you, you wrote a declaration together with Professor Gupta, whom I mentioned here, and Jay Bhattacharya, who is a professor of medicine at Stanford University. And in this declaration, you put forward the thesis, uh, I mean, just to su sum it up a little bit, that the remedy, in this case, lockdowns, can be worse than the disease itself. Can you elaborate a little bit on what you wrote in that declaration and what were your conclusions? Yeah, so first of all, the declaration is nothing new or novel. It's a basic uh, public health practice. And it's very much in accordance with the pandemic preparedness plan that many countries have prepared uh, in years past because we knew there were going to be a pandemic sooner or later. We just didn't know the nature of it. So uh, there are three basic principles of public health that has been thrown out the window uh, at the beginning of this year by most countries. One is that 
in public health, you have to look at things long term rather than short term. Uh, so focusing on sh uh, mortality this week or this month uh, can be counterproductive if you look at it long term. Uh, the other really important principle of public health is that you can't focus just on one single disease, in this case, COVID-19. You also have to look at all the all diseases, all health. And in this case, the lockdowns are generating a lot of uh, collateral damage on other aspects of, of health. For example, childhood vaccination rates have plummeted in many parts of the world, and we see now more measles because of that. Uh, in, in, in have some have we actually seen that, that, that the rate of measles is going up? Uh, we have seen uh, outbreaks of measles that you wouldn't have expected uh, if okay. the vaccination had been normal. Uh, another one is cardiovascular disease outcomes are worse. Uh, people are maybe dying at home instead of going to the hospital and so on because they are. Uh, another aspect is cancer. We actually see less, there's actually been less cancer this year. You would think that's a good thing, but that's actually not a good thing because the cancers are still there. It's just that they're not being detected. Oh. So if you, for example, if you don't do uh, pap smears, then you won't de detect the cervical cancer and a woman who would have maybe lived for 20 years will now maybe die, not this year typically, but maybe three or four years from now okay. because of, uh, of uh, less cancer screening in many countries. Another big problem is uh, mental health. We have seen deteriorating mental health. For example, in the United States, uh, there was a study in June that among uh, young adults aged, I think, 18 to 24, one quarter had been thinking about suicides, suicidal ideation. Uh, wow. Normally, it's maybe it's less than 10% throughout the whole year. And in this case, it was 25% in just one month. And there's other problems with mental health. Uh, ch uh, children and families with autism have a very hard time right now. Yeah. Uh, uh, opioid use in the United States and so on. So uh, the mental health, uh, collateral damage to mental health is, is enormous. So the second principle, we, we, have, we can't just look at one disease. We have to look at public health in general and what the, what the damage that the lockdown is doing on that. Uh, third is... Uh, we have to look at public health means public health of everybody in society. And what the lockdown is doing, it's protecting uh, uh, college students young, uh, who are very low risk and young adults, low risk young adults that can work from home, maybe lawyers or bankers or journalists or scientists and so on. Uh, so even though they are low risk because they're only in the 20s or 30s or 40s, they are protecting at the same time the working class is being exposed, even if they're old and high risk. So a 64-year-old uh, uh, cab driver or bus driver or janitor or somebody working in the supermarket, they are being exposed. Uh, and we know from a Swedish study, for example, that ca cab drivers are among the highest risk professions. So they are exposed even though they are old and high risk. So, so you're, are you saying that this the, the measures that are taken are actually exacerbating exacerbating the inequalities in society more or less? Very much so. And there's a very interesting uh, study from uh, Toronto where they have shown that uh, Toronto went into lockdown on March 23rd. And before that, the, the amount of COVID was about the same in the more affluent and less affluent areas of Toronto. But then when the lockdown went in, it flattened out and uh, slightly decreased in the affluent areas. It didn't go down to zero because that's impossible, but it sort of flattened out and uh, went slightly down. On the other hand, in the less affluent areas, it continued to, to rise sharply. Hmm. Oh, really? So, uh, so we basically put, so instead of protecting the old who are at higher risk, we're letting the young people get on with life and do what's important to get the society, what we need to do is society because not everybody can sit at home. We are uh, protecting the affluent, the professionals who can work from home while the working class have to be out there. And it's the working class that's building the immunity that will eventually protect all of us. Yeah, but 
those these are things that uh, you would think that the left wing parties in many countries would uh, would would uh, talk about and uh, and pursue that. Yes, kind of you would think so, policy, and it's very it's, strange. Yes. It's very strange for me because. Uh, back in April and May, I wrote some op-eds in the major daily newspapers in Sweden because Sweden is my home country. Uh, so I was defending the Swedish approach and Sweden has the socialist government. At the same time, I have defended the governors of Florida and North Dakota when they didn't want to close the schools and they have Republican governors. So I guess in Sweden, I'm a raving socialist and in the United <laughs> States, I'm a right-wing fanatic. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's interesting how things are, how thing, how you look at, at things. It's just a mindset, really. But you, in in this declaration, you, you, what do you want to do instead? What do you want to see instead? You talk about something you called uh, focused protection. That's what you you uh, prefer, isn't it? Yeah. So the key what thing is that? with yes, exactly. So the key thing with COVID nineteen is that while anybody can be infected and people from all ages do get infected, the, the, the risk of mortality, as well as the risk of severe disease, but if you look at the risk of mortality, uh, is very different by age. And it's not just a two-fold difference or a tenfold or even a hundredfold difference. It's more than a thousandfold difference in mortality risk between the oldest and the youngest. So among a thousandfold, old- more than a thousandfold difference. Correct, yeah. So that's enormous. Uh, so, uh, and much more than the influenza, for example. The influenza also have an age difference, but for COVID it's much bigger. So for older people, uh, COVID-19 is worse than influenza, more dangerous. So they what have to age, be much- What age range are you talking about? Is it people over the age of 70 or something? Uh, true, but also I think people in the 60s also at higher risk from COVID-19 than from okay. influenza. Uh, because uh, they have very small risk from influenza, but they have somewhat from medium to high risk from COVID-19. On the other hand, children, they have much less risk from COVID-19 than from the annual influenza. So are- the risk of a child dying of influenza is much bigger than the risk of a child dying from COVID-19. Correct. I mean, yeah. people don't even think about that there is a mortality from influenza. Uh, in young among young people but 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 that's a fact then yeah there is so so in the united states uh, every year somewhere between 200 and 1000 children die from influenza in the us and it mm. depends on the season because some seasons have a more severe influenza and some have more more mild influenza so in a more mild year it's around 200 and in a more severe year it will be around 1000 um so that's very tragic, uh, each of those deaths, and of course, uh, very awful for, for, for the families. But we don't close the schools because of it. No, we don't. And we would have to close the schools basically every year. But how many, and how many children are, are shown to have died from COVID-19 so far? So in the US, I think it's around 100 right now. Uh, 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 but you can then argue, well, I didn't go to school, so it's less. So, so we can look at Sweden instead, because Sweden was the only country who kept schools open throughout the, the only major Western country, I should say, that kept mm-hmm. schools open throughout the height of the pandemic in the spring. Uh, so everybody, daycare to school from age 1 to 15, they were open. And in Sweden, there are 1.8 million children in this age group. So during this time, uh, among this age, among these 1.8 million children, there were exactly zero deaths of COVID-19 in Sweden. Hmm. At the same time, teachers were not at higher risk uh, from COVID compared to the average of other professions. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there was also a study from Stockholm that looked at what was the risk from older people over 70. And they have an increased risk if they live with the working age adult. But if they also were live with an, a child, that doesn't decrease the risk any further. So there's not the child that are uh, at re- creating a risk for them. It's adult, uh, it's adult working, age, uh, working age people in the same whole household that mm-hmm. creates uh, an increased risk. 
And this has also been shown by a genetic study in Iceland, where they showed that they could look at the genetics of the virus and they could see that uh, while adults will often infect a child, uh, it's very rare that the other way around, that children will not often infect adults. Mm -hmm. Okay. It can happen, but it's, it's, it's not common. So the risk is very low for, for young people and it's, it's, it's a lot higher for older people than, than ordinary flu. So you were talking about uh, focus protection then. So what you would see instead of general lockdowns, which creates uh, some kind of, a, as, as we said, increased inequality uh, in actuality, you want to see some kind of pinpointing measures uh, like like what, not closing sco schools, but maybe closing uh, daycare centers or, or uh, uh, caring homes for elderly? Or what, what are the uh, concrete examples? Yeah, so to minimize, so the goal is to minimize uh, uh, overall mortality uh, by the time this pandemic is over. So the proposal is we have to do a better job protecting the elderly. And uh, in terms of concrete suggestions, they are sort of, they are different depending on the living situation. So the most vulnerable, the most high risk are older people in nursing homes, because not only are they old, but they're often frail. And uh, we have seen that uh, uh, the mortality of COVID-19 has been devastating in nursing homes. Mm -hmm. So that should be a top priority. So there should be frequent uh, testing of any staff person unless they al already had the disease so they are immune. So anybody who hasn't had it and doesn't have to have immunity already needs to be frequently tested uh, to make sure because they are often the one that brings it in to the nursing homes. Also, visit visitors are important for these nursing home residents. They need to have visitors from family and friends, but uh, is then, uh, then they should also then be tested, same day testing to make sure that they are not uh, carriers of COVID-19. Mm -hmm. And if they are positive, well, uh, they're gonna have to wait a few weeks before they make the visit and maybe somebody else can visit in the meantime. Also, it's important not to, have to, to minimize staff rotation, both there shouldn't be any mixing between nursing homes, but also, uh, each resident should have as few contact with as few staff as possible. Uh, so that staff rotation is important. And of course, it's also important with basic hygiene measures uh, in these nursing homes. And you can't, as they have done in some places in the US, in some state, they were sending actually sick residents to nursing homes where they then infected other nursing home residents, which was uh, it's enormously tragic, and that that in itself has killed killed uh, hundreds of older people. Mm -hmm. So uh, we can do much better taking care of pr pr uh, protecting the nursing home residents. Another group are the people who live at home, and uh, uh, they should. Uh, we should also help them. So going to the supermarket is not so important. If, if you're in your 70s and 80s, it's good to stay away from supermarket and other crowded settings and especially indoor settings. So we can help them with uh, the delivery of food and other necessities. It's important that they're still outside um, and it's important to exercise and so on. And it's important to see friends and family. So the ideal is to see friends and family outside, but if it has to be inside them, their family members should also be tested before they do that. Okay. Uh, uh, a third group are those who are in their 60s who are still in working. Mm -hmm. And if they can, they should be working from home. So for example, uh, schools should be open for in-person teaching, but teachers above 60 uh, should ideally work from home where they can either teach online or they could help other teachers by grading homework and exams and essays and so on. Mm. Uh, also, uh, when there are people who cannot work from home, we should let them take a three to four month sabbatical during the time when the transmission is highest. In the US, you could use social security fund or disability funds. Uh, 
uh, or some other pension funds to allow them to uh, to stay at home for a few months. Uh, the, the fourth group are people who live in uh, multi generational homes. Uh, so the children, as we said, are not uh, posing a, a danger to them. But if they live with working age adults, they have, I think it's about a 60% uh, excess risk based on the Stockholm study. So uh, they're uh, uh, either those working age adults, the young adults, if they can work at home, they will protect the older people. Uh, or maybe they should spend three or four months with an older sibling or uh, a friend, which they can sort of uh, self-isolate together with. And if that's not possible, we can uh, offer uh, 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 some of the empty hotel rooms mm. for them. Mm. Okay. And of course, there's the cost involved with that, but uh, that cost is much less than uh, the normal. Walking down the whole society. <laughs> yes. So, and uh, it's worth a lot of money to save people's lives. So uh, yeah. we, we should do those things. Yeah. And nursing homes is the, is the word I think I meant. I, I said um, daycare center, which is for children, I guess, but nursing homes is, is the place for old people. Yeah. Well, you have some concrete suggestions there. Have you been able to uh, convey these, you and your colleagues been able to convey these to politicians or other de decision makers? And uh, have you had any success in having them uh, be, be listened to? Uh, so, uh... Uh, if you look back, uh, of course, uh, Sweden didn't have a close to school, so that was a good decision. And I think that uh, in the US and Canada, they are still have problems with the school, but most European countries are now keeping the schools open, even as they lock down. So I think that's very good. Uh, when it comes to protecting the elderly, I think uh, that, uh, that has not been as successfully as I've hoped. Uh, they in the United States, there are efforts, there have been efforts uh, by, by, for example, Scott Atlas, who's been working hard to get testing kids out to nursing homes for staff and so on. And I think mm. that's critically important. Not all the states are using them as they should, but one example is where they are is Florida. Mm. So Florida uh, uh, is a state that uh, is sort of following uh, this focus protection uh, as uh, uh, or, or trying to do so as, as well as they can. Okay. Uh, so that's a positive sign, I think. And uh, we had. But a is it a, as a result of, of you and your uh, and Sunetra Gupta and Jay Bhattacharya's work, or just generally? They, I mean, they have been listening to these kinds of uh, opinions about the whole thing. Oh, it's not just the three of us. There's many others who are also yeah. advocating for this. So. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, uh, uh, so the governor of Florida had a roundtable and, and myself and Jay Bhattacharya was part of that roundtable. Um, and uh, I know that uh, he has also been reading what Sunita Gupta has been writing, but there's many others who have uh, been arguing for this since, since March and April. Yeah. So it's, it's nothing new that the three of us came up with. Okay, no. I guess so. And well, it depends on if you listen to researchers directly or if you read what they have to say in the media only, then you, you get two different pictures, images of what's happening here. You did mention Sweden a couple of times and, and the Sweden is all often related to in this context. And when you wrote your declaration, I think you were also highlighting Sweden as a commendable example. Is that still applicable as much because things have happened since then? And the numbers are ticking up a bit in Sweden again, I, I, I understand. But would you say it's still that Sweden is a, is a good example to follow? So the case numbers in Sweden are up a lot, but the case numbers are actually not very interesting because that depends so much on testing. Yeah. So if the country increases testing, of course, cases are going to go up. Uh, and uh, it's sort of a strange now because people are asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic and then they are tested and then suddenly people get all scared and, uh, uh, and afraid and th about uh, rising cases. Mm -hmm. So the metrics that we look, should look at is hospitalizations and mortality. And most importantly, we should look at excess mortality. Yeah. So hospitalizations are going up also slightly in Sweden. Mortality, there was a little bump, but not a big one. So we'll see, but it's not surprising that it's coming back uh, in Sweden because it's a seasonal thing. 
uh, but it's much less in Sweden than other European countries. And I think a big reason for that is because since the spring, Sweden has more immunity in the mm -hmm. population. So that's helping to keep the numbers low. But it's surprising what Sweden has done the last few weeks because uh, uh, they uh, Sweden uh, sort of uh, imposing uh, general age-wide restrictions on, for example, gatherings, but uh, uh, they are still not protecting the nursing homes well enough. No, there was some, I think today, when as, as we record this, there was a new uh, decision about nursing homes. I, I didn't, I just saw it briefly. I think they were going to in, introduce some kind of, uh, maybe not lockdowns of the nurse, nursing homes, but some kind of restrictions there again. Uh, okay, so that's good if they're moving there and, uh, for example, doing better testing because they're testing mm -hmm. a lot in society, but the key things to test is to protect the elderly. So mm -hmm. I hope that they do that. Uh, that would be very positive. And, uh, yeah. So would you say that what's happening now in Sweden with the, with the, 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 the numbers of, of deaths and, and hospitalizations coming up a little bit is nothing to worry about, really? You, you, you're just, you think it's just natural that it's happening now? I think it's needed to worry about it because we need to worry about the older people uh, as we now get into the second wave uh, because it's clearly seasonal. So we do have to worry about the elderly and we do have to do everything we can to protect them properly. Mm. But uh, there were some schools closing in Sweden now and that, yeah, I saw that makes no sense from a public health perspective. No sense um, in that. And uh, it doesn't uh, make sense to uh, uh, prevent young people from going to work. It doesn't mm. even make sense to prevent them to go skiing uh, and mm. those kind of things when the winter comes. Oh, it's really depressing when it when it's dark uh, all day and all night and it's cold and uh, you can't even you're not even allowed to meet your friends or do anything it's really i mean it's depressing as as it is from the beginning so uh <laughs> no it doesn't sound yeah, nice. being outside and exercising is good for your health yeah uh, uh, including for covid because we know that obesity and diabetes are risk factors for covid so mm. Uh, eating healthy and being out exercising, uh, whether you're a child or you're eight, is, is important. So we should not make it more difficult for people to do that. Yeah. The limited number of people that are allowed to meet, what do you, what do you have to say about that? Is I think that, is, good is that reasonable? All, uh, I think it's good for all people to stay away from big crowds, but for younger adults, no. Doesn't uh, matter. It makes not, not, no sense. Okay. So you, you shouldn't have any restrictions at all when it comes to gatherings, if it's only young people gathering, if they have uh, a rave people, party with 2,000 participants, for instance. Uh, I'm not an expert on rave parties. But, <laughs> but young people should be able to live there. Or a concert, a concert, yeah. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, uh, they should wash their hands, and if they are sick, they should stay home, and basic... Uh, uh, basic uh, measures like that, but there's no reason for them to uh, to restrict their uh, activities. They should be able okay. to live new normal lives and enjoy themselves. And uh, that's an important part of being a, a young adult. And mm. uh, once the parents should be able to enjoy their children and do things with their children. And that's important both for the parents and the children. So true. So how would you describe uh, SARS-CoV-2 as is the name of the virus in comparison with similar viruses that we have experienced? Uh, so it's worse, worse than the annual influenza uh, for the elderly, but not for the young. Um, it's not as bad as the, the 1918 flu. Mm -hmm. um, Which killed a lot of young males yes. uh, predominantly so so back uh, in the beginning of this year when i heard about the outbreak in wuhan uh, i wanted to know what was going on and in reading about it it was very quickly it was obvious to me as somebody who works with infectious disease outbreaks that this would be a worldwide pandemic this was not going to be able to contain it in in wuhan or in hubei okay. province 
so that was just a matter of time how it will spread to the rest of the world. At the same time, I was only worried for about 10 minutes because uh, uh, I have three children, ages uh, 18, four, and four. And as a parent, uh, all parents, we are mostly, the, the thing we are most concerned about is, of course, our children. Yes. So I read the numbers from Vu, and it was very clear from those numbers that my children were not at risk here. It was, okay. This was not a dangerous virus to the children, unlike the 1918 flu, which hit young people very harshly. Yeah. Uh, so in that sense, that's, uh, so this is a terrible disease, but uh, the one thing that uh, we should appreciate is that it doesn't affect young people. It's very mild, not dangerous to young people. And I'm very grateful for that uh, because I know that my kids are not at risk from this. So if it would have been a, a different kind of virus, more flu-like virus, would your recommendations have been different than they are now? Uh, yes, uh, certainly. Uh, uh, so the basic recommendation of protecting the high risk would still have been there. But if the high risk population is different, then the recommendation would have been different. So if this was yeah. a virus that was basically very dangerous to children, then yeah, we would have, and which was spread a lot between children, then we would have had to protect the children. Mm. And that should be the focus then. Now the focus so, should be protecting the old. If we had the Spanish flu back again now, we it would be perhaps reasonable to have lockdowns. Or uh, it would probably have been reasonable to, cl to, to close schools, for example. That might yeah. very well have been reasonable to do. Yeah. Uh, so uh, it's hard to say exactly what measures uh, it, it would be, but uh, uh, certainly they should have been different depending on... Uh, on the nature of the pandemic. Yeah. And also uh, in influenza, I mean, in the annual influenza, the schools are actually a major uh, vector of spreading the disease, influenza. Mm. So that's, for example, why we try to vaccinate children because that can reduce the spread yeah. of the disease. But for COVID-19, it's different. So schools are not a major vector or major a conduit of uh, spreading this disease. And and I mean, science knows this now since since many months back or many half a year back, I guess, what you're saying now. This is not uh, controversial the, in any way, is it? The age difference uh, has been known since the beginning of this year. Yeah. Since February, March. So uh, that's, and uh, I don't think all scientists realize it, that, that it's so, so enormous. Hmm. And the population in general don't realize it because there have been studied in the U.S. that older people, they are underestimating the risk of COVID. They think it's less dangerous than it actually is for them. But okay. young people are overestimating the risk. So they think that COVID is much more dangerous to them than it actually is. Hmm. Interesting. Psychology. Let's, let's delve a little bit into the psychology psychology of all this because, you know, as we have been describing here, almost every government in the world decided this spring within weeks to take these harsher, harsh measures against this virus, harsher measures than during any other pandemic in history, even when it became obvious, evident that, that it isn't that extremely lethal. Uh, what is your explanation? And then, as, you, as we said, just said here, this, the knowledge about the, the age difference in, in its danger and, and all that is known, must be known to the decision makers all over the world, but still they are locking down societies, they are closing schools. What is your explanation for all of this? That they are doing these, taking these measures despite the fact that, that you and so many other scientists and researchers know what's actually happening? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, so back in, in March, there was a rationale to sort of flatten the curve so as not to overburden the hospitals. Yeah. So, uh, I think that was a reasonable thing to do. And we, there was a lot of uncertainties. Uh, so, uh, 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 so to do a limited measures for a few weeks to flatten the curve so that not everybody has to go to the hospital at the same time, um, I think that was reasonable. But for some reason, that somehow quietly 
just became a goal to suppress the virus, to, to suppress the disease, uh, which cannot be done. And there were many of us back in the spring said that you can do it temporarily, uh, but it's just going to come back with mm. a vengeance, which we are seeing now. <laughs> so what, what those of us who were sort of arguing against these harsh lockdowns um, back in the spring, what we were saying has not turned out to be true. And, but uh, the politicians are just doubling down on the strategy that failed in the spring and trying the same failed strategy again. And it's you think it's prestige, prestige or something? I'm a simple scientist. So yeah, it's, I, not, it's difficult for you I, to know, but... I, I am actually a stunned and I don't understand it. Yeah. Uh, because... I mean, all the pandemic preparedness plans were there and they were just ignored. Uh -huh. And we still have situations uh, in the U.S. where the schools are being closed, are, are closed for, uh, uh, for to great detriment to children, and of course, especially to working class children, because children in more affluent families they can have a tutor or they can go to private school or which are open, uh, or do some part schooling and so on. So. So this is highly detrimental to children, and not just education, but also their physical health, their mental health, and their social development. Mm. So the politician like having the school closed, even though there's absolutely no public health reason to do so, at the same time, they're not concerned about uh, protecting the high-risk uh, older people in nursing homes, etc. They're not doing uh, what's needed to do that. And, and of course, there are exceptions because in the U.S., public health is actually not a federal uh, thing. It's, by law, it's the states, the state governors yeah. who are in charge. So there's so basically 50 different state policies. State. In, in, yeah. So, for example, Florida is doing well, but New York is a, a, a major disaster, for example. Mm. It's really mysterious, isn't it, that the politicians make these decisions despite everything we know. <laughs> Yeah, and it's also strange with the journalism. Many of the journalists who I think have sort of uh, been pushing a certain narrative that goes yeah. against what I think and what what most of my infectious disease epidemiology colleagues uh, think on these. Well, narratives. there's a negativity bias in journalism, as you know. There's a yeah. It if it if it bleeds, it leads. This classic, you know, mindset. It's sad. Uh, I was thinking that these lockdowns, have we ever actually engaged in this, these kinds of uh, broad lockdowns that we're seeing now? I mean, during earlier pandemics, for sure we haven't, not even the Asian flu in the 50s or the Hong Kong in the 60s, but have we, have there, has there ever been, have there ever been <laughs> lockdowns in any circumstance, even World War II, I I was thinking about that the other day, and I I, don't, I actually don't think we have done this before. Do you do you know do you know about this? Have you have, are there any other historic examples of these kinds of broad lockdowns where where you're not supposed to to even go out of your home? Uh, there has been nothing even close to this scale. There is an example from England, and I forgot the name of the village, but uh, I think it was in the 17th century. Uh, there was a village that was ravaged by the pest, uh -huh. and they actually self-isolated themselves, not to protect themselves from the outside, but to protect them outside from themselves so that the pest would not move outside to the village and spread further. So it's sort of the opposite purpose. In yes. Sense. Uh, but yes, that's one nice example, that. and it was actually successful in the sense that there were, of course, mortality in this village, but it did not spread uh, to other places. So they were actually doing like a self-sacrifice. So it was a bottom-up uh, approach rather than a top-down, as we're seeing now. Yeah. So, uh, uh, but uh, so so no, there's not been anything close to this. If you look at the pandemic preparedness plans, they don't talk about lockdowns. No. And hmm. so it's a huge experiment, and it's a terrible experiment because of all the collateral damage. And yeah. we don't yet know what the numbers are, but uh, the final numbers are because it will take time before we know the cancer deaths, for example, cause the extra cancer deaths caused by the lockdown. 
or we can compare a little bit with United States, which went into a, 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 a lot of lockdowns, while Sweden uh, was much more mild. And in the US, uh, there are over 200,000 COVID-19 deaths, but on top of that, there is another almost 100,000 additional deaths that are excess deaths compared to the average of previous years. Mm-hmm. So we already seen the from, US... from what deaths from from different kinds of. Uh... Uh, so this is uh, so the all cause mortality, the excess all cause mortality from all deaths. Okay. In this, uh, for for this year in the US, mm. uh, is around three hundred and thirty or something. The last I saw. At the same time, the the COVID ex- death was two hundred and thirty five. I think I don't remember the exact numbers. So it's about a little bit less than 100,000. So the number of excess deaths is, is almost 100,000 more than the COVID-19 deaths. I see, I see. So these and are and your, of, your theory is that those excess deaths are uh, a result of uh, uh, the, measure, the harsh measures in, in different uh, aspects of those? Yeah, so for example, uh, uh, cardiovascular disease, somebody who did not go to the hospital when they should have to get the preventive treatment or, or whatever, and then they die at home from, from a cardiovascular death. Okay. And they would have, been, they would have survived otherwise. Uh, that's just one of many examples. If we, com- if we compare that to Sweden, Sweden has a little bit over 6,000 COVID-19 deaths now. Yeah. Uh, but the excess death, if we look at Sweden this year compared to the same periods as the average of the previous five years, it's about 2,000 excess deaths. So Sweden actually has fewer excess deaths than COVID-19 deaths. Yeah. Uh, while United States have more excess deaths than COVID-19 deaths. Oh, interesting. That says something, probably, yeah. Yeah, and Sweden uh, has been able to maintain its health system more normally. Mm. Uh, for example, there was no reduction in childhood vaccination rates in Sweden because of of the pandemic, there was a slight drop in uh, cancer screening. Yeah, uh, but it has been much less. Other aspects of health has been much less affected uh, in Sweden by the by the pandemic than in uh, than in the United States and other countries. Yeah, that's you that's really that interesting. In the numbers of the excess death numbers. Mm. We have we've had for for many weeks during the the the, the fall here. Sweden has had. Under mortality, so to speak. Correct. As yeah, as I understand. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, compared to 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 the normal rate uh, previous years, so um, there's a lot of talk about the vaccine now that is coming, or several several versions of of a vaccine. I guess. How much would you say w- will an effective vaccine change the state of play, and and how fast? So with a good vaccine. Uh, we don't have anything on the market yet, but uh, if we have a good vaccine that's both a good efficacy and good safety, that would be uh, one more uh, tool and an excellent tool to uh, to do this focus protection. Uh, for example, vaccinating nursing home staff. Yeah. Uh, also, of course, hospital uh, staff should be a high priority. Uh, not not just for their own protection, but primarily to protect the, the residents of the nursing homes. Depending on the quality of the vaccine, uh, we may also uh, uh, vaccinate uh, older people. Mm. Uh, but we don't yet know the efficacy of the vaccines for people in the 80s and 90s, uh, because sometimes their immune system uh, is different. So, that, so it, even though the vaccine might be, uh, have good efficacy in, in younger adults, uh, that may or may not uh, carry over to older people. So those are things we don't yet know about the vaccines that are, are coming. But whatever the case is, we can use this as one more tool to protect the older members of society. So uh, that would be excellent uh, when we can get that. And of course, the sooner the better. Uh, it's a little bit unfortunate with the Northern Hemisphere because we already have this second wave. So by the time the vaccine is here, uh, and of course it has to be manufactured and distributed, let's say by January and February, uh, it's sort of a few months late to... Uh, to stop uh, the second wave. The second yeah. wave. Mm. Uh, it's, it, it comes more timely for those countries in the Southern Hemisphere 
that's yeah. going to have a second wave in their winter and our summer. Yeah, South America has been hard hit, I understand. Argentina and Brazil. And yeah, Peru also, for example. Peru also. Mm. Yeah. Okay, so, uh, but but you wouldn't advocate for a mandatory vaccination, uh, flat out, uh, the whole population? A key principle of public health is trust. Yeah. And if you try to mandate something, that's going to lead to a lot of suspicion and a lack of trust between public health officials and the population. So the best thing is to, uh, uh, to make it voluntary. Mm. And, uh, in the beginning, anyhow, I mean, there's going to be more people who want the vaccine than who can get it. Probably. So, uh, uh, and the, pub- the, the, the trust in science and public health has already taken a hit because of the lockdowns in the population. So yeah. we have to be very, very careful about that. Uh, if we have a good vaccine, and that's both uh, a good efficacy and safety, and we were gonna mo- we will monitor the safety as soon as uh, we will monitor it both, both in the phase three trials before it's approved, but we will also continue to monitor the safety after because uh, for like special populations or very rare, rare events, so that will be monitoring and, and involved with the Centers for Disease Control in those efforts. So okay. that will be monitored. So uh, I think if we, if we have a good vaccine that's both eff- uh, effective and safe, then people are going to want to take it. People are not stupid. Hmm. So, uh, <laughs> no, I'm sure you're right. Yeah, many people are going to take it voluntarily. At least in, 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 in many countries, I don't know, countries which, which have these... Tradition of more authoritarian rule might be a different story, but and, it, and as, as as I mentioned, I mean, depending on the nature of the vaccine, it could very well be that it's a good thing to vaccinate some people, but other people should not get the vaccine. For example, yeah. yeah. Well, we have the example of the, the the swine flu vaccine, which showed to cause in in a few people, uh, albeit, but but in some people, uh, narcolepsy. Uh, is if that is a word in English, I don't know if it's narcolepsy. Well, it was was a narcolepsy. Yeah, narcolepsy. That was a collateral damage from that from that uh, vaccine, which was produced very quickly, as far as I remember. Yeah, and it was actually only some of the vaccines. So uh, uh, the vaccines with adjuvants that was used in, for example, Sweden and Finland and some other countries. Uh, but uh, in the U.S., uh, it was also used, I think, in Canada, but it was not used in, U- in the United States. Okay. Uh, and the vaccines used uh, in the United States did not have this adverse reaction. So it was only some of the vaccines that had these narcolepsy problems. Others did not. Okay. Interesting. So this has been super interesting. Uh, Martin Kuldorf, Thank you very much for joining the show and keep up the good work. Thank you so much, Anders. I really appreciate it and it's great talking to you.